Hi, you guys. So today's lecture is going to focus around the concept of blood pressure. In the last two lectures, we've been dealing with the heart or the cardiovascular system, and this one is moving away from the heart to a characteristic of blood, a quality of blood that is tightly regulated and maintained within a homeostatic range. Blood pressure is generated by the heart. So when we talked about the mechanism by which cardiac muscle contracts, that's going to come back to us when we have this conversation about blood pressure. Before we begin, we probably should define pressure. This is a concept that truly today we're introducing blood pressure. We're going to start talking about all different kinds of pressures. Pressure is essentially um, a force applied over a certain surface area. So if you know a force that you apply to something with a pow pow, that is a very massive force, I must say, and then you know the surface area to which you are applying that force, you can calculate the pressure. Pressure is usually measured in something like atmospheres, or in physio we're often going to um, measure our pressures in millimeters of mercury. So this is just a unit of pressure. Now I'm going to give you a little uh, analogy. What? Me? Analogies? I know this is shocking to you. But I'm going to give you an, an analogy to help you kind of visualize this concept of pressure. The force can come from anywhere. In my analogy, my body weight is going to be the force, and I'm going to apply a force to your hand by standing on your hand with my foot. Now, do you agree that no matter how I stand on your foot, no matter what I do to stand on your, excuse me, I'm standing on my foot, and my foot is upon your hand. Your hand is on the ground, and I am standing upon it. No matter what I do, the, unless I, like, jump up and down or grab a whole bunch of bricks or something and, like, hang on to heavy things, I won't do that to you. I'll just stand on your hand. The force that I am exerting is my body weight. My body weight is the force that's pushing down on your hand. The surface area, I can actually modify that depending on what kind of shoes I'm wearing. So I'm going to give you two choices. You can either have me, okay, watch me try and draw this crazy scene. You can have me stand on your foot. Oh, good Lord. Yes, indeed, I know exactly what I'm drawing. What is this? <laughs> well, it's a little bit sketchy, but this is an attempt to draw a diving flipper. If I were to stand on, in fact, if I were to stand on your hand with a diving flipper, hmm, I mean, I can kind of be like, well, yeah, it'll probably hurt a little bit, but, you know, okay, whatever. Or I can stand on your hand wearing, yeah, what's that? That's something, honestly, whether I was standing on your hand wearing diving flippers or stiletto heels, it doesn't matter because I'm probably going to kill myself wearing either of those items of footwear. But you have a choice. Go ahead and tell me true. Do you want me to stand on your hand with that area, that surface area, or with this surface area? Which would be proper? And my force that I'm applying is the same because it's my body weight. So do you agree that I mean, there's like no question. I could probably, my body weight could probably, and a stiletto heel could probably poke a hole in your hand if I stood all my body weight on your hand with that stiletto heel. This, the surface area here, let's just say it's like one centimeter squared. That's my surface area on that thing. A diving flipper, the surface area here is like, I don't know, one foot squared. I mean, that's a huge surface area compared to the stiletto heel. And the point is that my force that I'm applying is the same, but clearly the pressure is different. I hope that you see that, yes, indeed, go ahead, Wendy, stand on my hand with the diving flipper if, I, if you must stand on my hand with something. 
not the stiletto heel because I'll poke a hole in your hand. That's the concept of pressure. Now, pressure of fluid. How, I mean, diving flipper is awesome. Well, fluid can apply a force, especially to the walls of the tube that it is contained by. And then the amount of surface area in that wall, that's going to be the um, measurement of blood pressure. Our units for blood pressure are going to be millimeters of mercury. Now, a couple of things to think about. First of all, low blood pressure is known as hypotension. And hypotension, hypo, low tension, basically results in low perfusion. What is perfusion? Basically capillary exchange. If you have low perfusion, you don't have enough pressure to drive your blood through the blood vessels, through the capillaries, where gas exchange and nutrient exchange take place. On the, now, do you want low blood pressure in your brain? Do you want low perfusion in your brain? Your brain does not want that. Your brain needs oxygen, it needs glucose, and if you have low blood pressure to your brain, it's not getting enough of the nutrients that it needs and it's not getting rid of all the garbage that it needs to get rid of, what's going to happen to you? Have you ever stood up and all of a sudden you get all lightheaded and you're like, whoa, I almost passed out because of low blood pressure when you change your sitting and standing? Usually that means go get some water. Like you are probably dehydrated and you can probably deal with it by um, increasing your body fluid volume. That will help. High blood pressure is just as bad as low blood pressure. High blood pressure is more of a chronic thing. It is hypertension. And the problem with hypertension is um, vessel damage. So if you imagine like taking, oh, imagine a balloon, like a water balloon hose type thing, but kind of a thin floppy hose. And if you just trickle water through the hose with low pressure applied to the walls of your little blood vessel balloon thing that you stuck to the end, ends of it, I mean, you're going to be fine. Like that's not going to do anything. You probably are going to have low perfusion, but whatever. You've seen those drip hoses. You know, what are those called? Like the things that you lay out, you attach them to your faucet in your garden, and then they just like leak. They're like leaky hoses. But you put them in your garden, and the whole point of them is to water your garden. That you probably aren't going to have a whole lot of leakiness if you have low pressure pushing out of your, like a low amount of water coming out. But if you increase the amount of water coming out of your little water balloon, tube, can you imagine that you could actually break your balloon? Like you could do damage to the vessel wall if the pressure is too high. And vessel damage is associated with cardiovascular disease. Atherosclerotic plaques, hardening of the arteries, happens in places where blood vessels are damaged damaged blood vessels lead to an inflammatory response. That inflammatory response initiates, like, plaque formation. They've done studies to look at where your arteries harden, and you're more likely to have atherosclerotic plaques in places where there's a high pressure and a lot of turbulence in the blood, so the, the blood is, like, going around a crazy corner, like in a water slide, and you get, like, the twirly, crazy, whirly twirliness, that turbulence that you create, that can do damage to your blood vessels. Changes in blood pressure. If you experience hypotension or hypertension, like you go outside of the homeostatic range, your body detects that change with baroreceptors, which are sensory receptors that detect pressure changes. Baroreceptors in your blood vessels detect changes in blood pressure. Send the message to the medulla oblongata in your brain, which is basically the integrator 
where the information is processed, and the medulla oblongata sends a message out to blood vessels and heart and remedies the situation within two heartbeats. Blood pressure changes, your body receives the information. Two heartbeats later, your blood pressure is back within homeostatic range. That's how important it is to your body to maintain blood pressure, and that's why we're going to spend an entire lecture talking about this concept. All right, let's talk about it's important to bring back your blood vessel anatomy so that we can have a visual for what are these blood vessels that we're dealing with so that we can have context for the pressure. The function of the blood vessels is directly related to, oh, imagine this, its structure. There are five different types of blood vessels that we're going to look at, and we've already talked about the biggies. Arteries carry blood away from the heart while veins carry blood to the heart. Arteries, when they carry blood away from the heart, they branch into arterioles, which branch into capillaries, which are tiny little blood vessels where exchange of materials takes place. In fact, let's just make a note of that. It's kind of like the whole point of the blood vessel system is to allow for exchange at the capillaries. Every single cell is within, I don't know, like a micrometer of a capillary in order for that cell to survive. We're going to have an entire lecture on capillary exchange, so we don't need to go into a great deal of detail right now. What we do want to know is the structure of the capillaries that would therefore enable their function of exchange. And here's the scoop. Capillaries literally are nothing but endothelium. And so endothelium is this special inner layer. It's a specialized epithelial tissue, and it's called endothelium. And I'm trying to draw simple squamous epithelial cells. That was a really impressive job, wasn't it? All of our vessels have endothelium, and the structure of the endothelium, I'm going to have to draw lots of other layers on these guys, so I'm going to make their diameters smaller than my capillary, but in actuality their diameters are actually bigger, and I'm going to note the diameters here just so you can keep perspective. But every single vessel type has that inner layer of simple squamous epithelium called the endothelium. But capillaries don't have anything else going on. They don't have elastic tissue or smooth muscle or fibrous tissue. They don't have any other layers, which makes them perfect for their function of exchange of nutrients and gases. The thickness of the wall of the vessel itself is the thing I'm going to make note of in this category or in this column. The thickness of a capillary is half of a micrometer, half point five of a micro meter. Let's make sure that's super clear. That's tiny doggies, really tiny. And the diameter of a capillary is somewhere between four and ten micrometers. Now maybe that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot to you, but let's compare it to our other vessels and, and hopefully um, come up with some, some good comparisons. I'm also, in addition to drawing a vessel over here, I'm going to do a little graph that you will see like amounts of each of the tissue types in each vessel so we can compare. The amount of endothelium in each vessel, just like the thickness of the endothelium in the vessel, is the same in every single kind of vessel. That's not going to be the case with our other um, tissues. Let's look at the elastic tissue next. The elastic tissue is something that we are going to find in only two of our vessel types. We find elastic tissue layers in the artery and in the vein. But if you look at the size of the elastic tissue or the amount of elastic tissue that you find, the amount is different. So the amount of elastic tissue in a vein is much smaller than the amount of elastic tissue in an artery. So does that work for you? 
there's more elastic tissue. I would like to be able to draw it in my picture, but I just don't have enough room to do that. Elastic tissue isn't found anywhere else. What would elastic tissue allow? In fact, elastic tissue allows you to maintain pressure. Pressure, there's a reason why hypotension, low blood pressure is bad. If you don't have enough pressure, you can't push the blood around your body. So you have to have a way to maintain pressure. The arteries, because they have so much elastic tissue, they're actually able to absorb the pressure from the pump of the heart. They're able to absorb that pressure and stretch and then contract. Even though they're not really contracting, they're just elastically recoiling and that provides an additional push to push that blood onward through the body. Okay, smooth muscle. Who of our good buddies has smooth muscle? Interestingly, the arteries have the most smooth muscle out of all of these guys. The smooth muscle layer comes next, and you can imagine that we could look at that histologically. Arterioles also have a rockin' layer of smooth muscle. What is smooth muscle? What is the function? Our veins do have some smooth muscle. Now, the smooth muscle, the amount of smooth muscle in my veins, which are bigger vessels, is about the same as the amount of smooth muscle in the arterioles and it's nothing compared to the amount of smooth muscle in the arteries. The arteries allow bigger stretch because of the elastic tissue, and they allow constriction, vasoconstriction, which, again, that pushes the blood onward. Arterioles allow a regulation of blood to various locations. Because they are surrounded, they can, they're the site of the majority of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, which is functionally a very important thing to be able to do. Arterioles can help regulate the amount of blood that goes to various body parts. We've already talked about how in a sympathetic nervous response, we're probably going to want to supply blood to certain places like skeletal muscles more than other places like digestive system. And in fact, it's true, vasodilation takes place in skeletal muscles during a sympathetic nervous response, whereas vasoconstriction takes place in the digestive system in order to, like, save your blood energy. Like, why spend our energy digesting when really we should be running away from the bear? Okay, I think I'm still good. The next tissue that we want to add is the fibrous tissue, and here's the scoop. Arteries, arteries are big, and they've got a chunk of fibrous tissue. It's, it's, a, it's a not as thick of a chunk as what I drew here. Sorry about that. But it's a, it's a healthy chunk. Venules also have a little chunk of fibrous tissue surrounding them. The fibrous tissue is going to give them some additional structural support, and my veins also have fibrous tissue surrounding them. Veins are floppy little things, which how are we going to know if they're floppy or not? The floppiness is going to, we can look at the differences in thickness and diameter to be able to see things like that. So let's compare our thicknesses and diameters. The thickness of a vein, this is interesting, the thickness of a vein goes up to a half of not a micrometer, a half a millimeter. Make sure you get your M's proper. This is a mu sign, which is different than the M sign, and that means micro as opposed to milli. Veins have a thickness of about half of a millimeter, and they can range in diameter, which makes perfect sense. We can range from 0 0.1 millimeters up to 20 millimeters in diameter. So my little purple circle here can go up to 20 millimeters. Nothing else gets that big. In fact, the diameter of an artery can go from 0 0.1 to just 10 
millimeters. But 10 millimeters, dude, that's a, that's big. That's a, that's that big. That's a wide, they can stick your finger in that. That's a big old diameter for a big old artery. The thickness of the artery walls can go up to one millimeter. A millimeter thick wall, this is something that since you've taken anatomy and you've hung out with my dead bodies, you've seen the difference between the floppy, thin veins and the thick, round arteries. And it's like you can bounce on the artery because the wall of the artery is so thick. Why? It has much more smooth muscle. It has a lot more elastic tissue. It's surrounded in this nice fibrous tissue. It just carries a lot more structure and holds its round shape. The thin, big diameter, that's not a word, but the big diameter and thin wall of a vein is evident by these numbers as well. Now, venules, you're going to expect them to be smaller. We're going back into micrometer land. The venules have a thickness of about one micrometer. Makes sense, not half a micrometer like a capillary, but one micrometer because we added a half a micrometer of fibrous tissue around the capillary. The diameter of a venule can range from 10 to 100 micrometers. Guess what 100 micrometers is? 0.1 millimeters, same thing. Arterioles, on the other hand, we're going to go from 10, wait, that's our diameter, 10 to 100 micrometers. And again, our, our relationship here is the same. Look at that. The thickness of an arteriole can be up to six micrometers. Okay, so that gives you a big picture. It's important because regulating blood pressure is going to happen in vessels that have the smooth muscle. And it's also important because um, blood pressure is maintained by the blood vessels that have that elastic tissue in them for stretching. Next, we're going to look at some characteristics of blood flow. And these flow characteristics, these things that we're going to pay attention to when we're talking about flowing blood, we're also going to look at them when we're talking about flowing air in the respiratory system or even flowing um, PP when we talk about the urinary system. So let's look at um, some flow issues in the next one. There are two main characteristics that we want to talk about when thinking about the movement of fluid or blood in this case or really anything that acts fluid like even air. And those two characteristics are flow. So we know that fluids can flow. And then we also intuitively have a sense of resistance, which is basically friction that opposes flow. And here's the fact. Fluids, all fluids, flow down pressure gradients. We go down pressure gradients. So blood is going to move always from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone. This is, thankfully, incredibly intuitive. This makes sense to us. If you imagine me squeezing a balloon, the high pressure zone where I'm applying the squeezing force is the air is going to move out of that zone. It's going to move out of the high pressure zone if it can. And it will move and pop the balloon out in the area where there's less pressure because my hands aren't squishing it. Wind is nothing more than atmosphere moving from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Resistance, on the other hand, resistance is opposition to flow. So any force that opposes the flow is considered resistance. And in our situation, almost 100% of the time, we're talking about friction. Now think about that for a second. My little analogy, what? I have an analogy? I know this is shocking to you. My analogy shocker is imagining my children playing on a slide that is made 
that is lined with shag carpet. Seriously? I mean, even if it's like a super steep slide, like go sit on the slide made of shag carpet, like go climb inside that slide and sit down. And if it's, you know, shag carpet is like the super long, awesome, like make it like pea soup green or something like that and throw it in your house, that would be fantastic. I actually would like to have a room that was full of shag carpet even on the walls because then I wouldn't stress about my children like beating the holy living tar out of each other in the pea soup green shag carpet room because if they like slid down the shag carpet room or the shag carpet slide, there's so much friction that they're going to go really slow. If you take the shag carpet out or we race, We've got the shag carpet slide and we've got the regular slide. There is still friction in the regular slide. There still is resistance to downward movement through the slide. There's resistance to flow, but the resistance is much less in a regular slide and you're going to go faster. There's less friction opposing your movement down the hill. In the uh, blood vessels, more resistance could be atherosclerotic plaques. If you have thickening, hardening arteries and you're decreasing the diameter of your blood vessel because you've got this crap that's filling your blood vessel lumen, that's going to create more resistance to flow. And just think for a second about what could that possibly do to the pressure. If you increase resistance to the flow, that automatically increases the pressure. Knowing that flow always moves, flow is created by pressure gradients. If we didn't have pressure gradients, if you didn't have a difference in pressure in your blood vessels, your blood would not move anymore. What creates the pressure gradient in your heart? I mean, I just told you the freaking answer. Dang it. What creates pressure gradients in your blood? Oh, you guys are so smart. Your heart creates the pressure gradients. I knew you guys were paying attention out there. Good job. So your heart, because it's this awesome beating pump that's creating a high pressure zone, holy cow, go review your Wiggers diagram and see what happens during ventricular contraction. See what happens to the pressure inside the ventricle. You create this super high pressure zone. The fluid, the blood is like, dude, get me out of here. I got to find a low pressure zone to head to. That creates flow. Your vessels can create resistance, but the flow is generated by your heart. So let's take a second to rewind and figure out some characteristics of how your heart creates flow. Because your heart, the mechanism of heart muscle contraction is a little bit different than skeletal muscle contraction and that allows for some interesting um, regulation that can happen from your actual little heart. Pat your heart, everybody. Oh, I love your heart. Okay, I'll be right back and we'll talk about heart contraction.